Hey guys, and welcome to Petrol Ped. One of the challenges of reviewing cars at the moment is if you review an electric car, the petrol heads hate you, and if you review a petrol car, the electro heads hate you. Well, I reckon this car should keep both people happy. This is a Mazda MX-30 eSky Active REV. A mouthful, I know, but it has an electric drivetrain. That keeps the electric people happy. And it has something that it shares in common with some pretty cool Mazdas of the past. The RX-7, the RX-8, even the Le Mans winning 787B, because that car has a rotary engine. Now I do try my best to bring you interesting cars. I honestly think this has so many interesting things. I'm gonna start off with the drivetrain. We'll come on to the styling in a little while because I think there's plenty to talk about on that front as well. But this car has a really interesting drivetrain. It is an all electric drivetrain. It's a drivetrain that's focused more around efficiency and long range. It's only 170 PS. And as an electric vehicle, it has a really tiny battery, a 17.8 kilowatt hour battery. And that means its range, well, its range isn't very good, really. It'll do about 50 miles on all EV running. And you think, well, that's rubbish. But the thing is, this car isn't an electric car. It's a plug-in hybrid. And the really cool thing, normally in a plug-in hybrid, you have a petrol engine that drives the wheels and you have an electric motor and battery pack that can alternate between petrol drivetrain and electric drivetrain. So you've got quite a complex underpinnings in the car. This car is only ever driven by an electric motor and the electric battery pack. But when the battery pack starts to run down and you run out of battery after your 50 miles of range, that's when the petrol engine kicks in because this car has a tiny 830cc rotary engine that effectively acts as a range extender. So when the battery needs to be charged up as you're driving along, the engine kicks in and charges the battery and keeps the battery topped up. And you might be sitting there going, well, why would you do that? Why don't you just go all electric? And for many of you, especially on the electro head side of my intro to the video, I get that. You'd go a full all electric platform and that's all fine and dandy, but that brings with it all of the anxiety that many people have around charging in public, the challenges of charging at home and the challenges of general range anxiety. The cool thing about this car is you get all the benefits of an electric drivetrain in terms of tailpipe emissions when you're in cities, in terms of the smooth, quiet driving, in terms of the cost of driving. But if you want to go a little bit further than the range of the car, then you just put some petrol in the back and you can go as far as you want. I was looking back through my archive and I honestly think I've only featured one Mazda in the eight years I've been doing Petroped and that was an MX-5 RF, the kind of hard top convertible. Brilliant little car, absolutely fantastic. And I do quite like Mazda styling. That MX-5 is a beautiful little thing. And, and this, this is quite quirky. And I had loads of people reach out to me and said, Pet, are you gonna do the MX-30? So I had a chat with my good friends at Hendy and I borrowed this from Hendy Mazda in Eastleigh. And it's their brand new demonstrator. When I picked it up, it had less than 200 miles on the clock. So it's great to get my hands on it. I do like the front end of the car. I really like this kind of, um, the design around the lights and the just, it's an interesting car to look at. And I quite like the rear, especially the rear lights. I don't know, is it just me? I see a little bit of Ferrari in there. <laughs> I know that's stretching the design similarities a little bit. It's got a decent sized boot though, because they are trying to make this car as light as possible. One of the downsides of the whole plug-in hybrid concept is you've, you've got to carry a, a motor and an engine around. And the nice thing about this is the little Wankel engine is, is only tiny. It doesn't weigh a great deal. The battery pack's small. So the curb weight of this car is only about kind of 1800 kilos. So that kind of gives it quite a nice dynamic driving feel. 
The next thing though is it's got quite interesting doors. Now I really like the side profile of the car. It's got the kind of crossover styling with the black trim around the wheels and down the sills. It makes it look kind of squat and purposeful. A couple of nice little bits of detail. I love this little badge on the wing, which is basically the inner shape of the rotor on the rotary engine. I think that's very smart. And then I really like this little Mazda trim here. Just brings the car together, but it's the doors I want to talk to you about. I guess the first things first, nothing too special about the driver's door, but it's the door into the rear part of the car. I guess it shares a similarity with the RX-8 had a similar configuration, and that is what Mazda call the flexible door. Some of you might call it a suicide door, and you think, well, why would you do that? First up for me, there are so many cars that come out as a concept with this style of door because it, it really does open up ingress and egress into the car, but it never makes it through into production. This car is predominantly a two-seat car with, with a small bench seat in the back. So this, this flexible door makes getting into the car really easy. So if you were had limited mobility and, you know, and, and so on, getting in and out of the car is super, super easy. Getting into the back of the car, you've got a little button on the back here that can move this seat forward and backwards and you can climb in. Although I would say the speed of that movement is a little bit like when I had the Defender 90. I'd actually quite like that to just be on a mechanical slider and then you'd get in and out the back much, much more easily. But this rear door houses the seat belt uh, and the latch up the top. So I think that is really, really interesting. Very quirky design indeed. First up, there's some really interesting material choices in here. The most obvious one is it's got cork in it. I'm not quite sure how I feel about that. It's certainly nice to see a different material. It's used because if you look back at the history of Mazda, uh, they, they were involved in cork manufacture, apparently. And then on the top of the um, doors, you've got a kind of almost like a, a material felt. You've got um, some nice leatherette material. It's, it's a really interesting, um, interesting place from a material choice and, and a nice looking design. First good news, as I'm sure many of you will be happy, there is no touch screen in here. Well, actually that's not quite right. The, if I just turn the car on, doom, 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 this screen here, which is for your climate control, that has touch screen, but it also has physical buttons on the outside. I'm just gonna turn that off to, to stop the blowers. So there is a little bit of touch screen there, but the main infotainment screen up there is not a touch screen interface. That is controlled by this jog wheel and set of buttons just here. Now there's positives and negatives to that. The positives are if you're using the native features in the infotainment system, including the native sat nav, they are all designed to be controlled by a rotary dial. So it's actually relatively easy to navigate. And it's not a million miles off of what it's like in my Mini, actually, with the rotational dial. But you can also use Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, although it is a wired connection. And that wired connection, frustratingly, is, is behind this screen, there's a tray and I've got my cable here for my iPhone. And then so when you plug it in, you put your iPhone down there, which is a bit annoying, although there's an argument to say you shouldn't be touching it when you're driving anyway. And then you can put Apple CarPlay on there. The challenge with that is Apple CarPlay and Android Auto as an interface, they are designed to be interacted with using touch screen. You can interact with them on a jog wheel. It's just a bit clunky, but many of you will be happy because it's not touch screen. Um, and then, just in terms of drive modes, before we get driving, because I think the best way to describe stuff in this car is when we go out driving, um, I've got three drive modes. And there's a little selector here, just next to the gear lever. I can put it in EV mode. That forces the car to run in EV only. Um, and uh, just in terms of performance, by the way, this car will do 0 to 62 in about 9.1 seconds. 
and is limited to a top speed of about 87 miles an hour, which is still 17 miles an hour above the speed limit. But it is very much designed as a more efficient car than an outright sports car. But EV mode only, you force the car into EV mode. At uh, normal mode, what will happen is the uh, the rotary engine will top the battery up as and when needed and the battery will never drop below 1% so you'll never run out of battery so you'll as long as you've got fuel in the car you're never going to be in a in a problem I guess the only time you'd be in a problem is if you had no more petrol left uh, and the, eventually the battery pack will run down and the car's going to stop working but as long as you've got fuel in the car the engine will just kick in and top things up and then there's a charge mode and what you can do with the charge mode is you go into a setting on there and you can set the battery level percentage that will when you hit that that's when the rotary engine kicks in so at the moment I've got that set to 60% so when the battery hits 60% the rotary engine kicks in and it starts topping the battery up and keeps the battery topped up at 60% and you can set that anything from 10 to 100% if you wanted to so I figured the best way to put it to the test would be to take it on a long journey. I've got to go to the Cotswolds tomorrow. I'm meeting up with the guys to record our next couple of episodes of the Drive Talk podcast. And I thought I would take this along. Um, I've got pretty much a full tank of fuel. So it's showing about a 200 mile range on the petrol side of things. Um, and at the moment, I've only got 40% of the battery left. And it's showing me 13 miles of pure EV running on 40% of battery. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick the car on charge overnight. Now the really cool thing, because the battery is such a small one, um, it supports 50 kilowatt DC charging. You can get a 20 to 80% charge in this in like 20 minutes. And even on a seven kilowatt wall box like I got at home, um, I can do a, tw a 20 to 80% charge in about an hour and a half. So it's very quick to, to top the battery up if you are going to plug it in but yeah really interesting so the next thing we're going to do uh, put the car on charge overnight and then tomorrow we're heading to the Cotswolds okay it's now the next morning and we are ready to head off on our little road trip the car's been on charge overnight I do have a companion with me you coming on a road trip dude have the petrol pooch with me uh, I've got two hours 20 minutes 115 miles for my journey and on a full battery I've got 44 miles of pure EV running a combined petrol and EV range of 230 miles and I've also reset the trip for both mpg and miles per kilowatt hour so I reckon that should do us so I'm going to get going and then on the way I'll talk a little bit more about what this car's like to drive. So on our way, how quiet and how smooth is this car? And how big are the potholes down my road? <laughs> uh, really bad. So yeah, I'm going to um, just be in normal mode. I'm not gonna force it into EV because um, I would only do that if I was going on a short trip within that 40 miles if I was going into Chichester and back or you know, you know a 10, 15, 20 mile journey, then I'd force it into EV um, and just run on the, on the pure electric. I'm gonna put it in normal mode, so I will deplete the battery a little bit. And then the plan is, once I've depleted the battery below, now I think I've got, I've reset the charge limit to 70% just as a demonstration. So what I'll do, is I'll wait until I've depleted the battery to below 70% and then I'll put it into charge mode and in charge mode I'll basically uh, be able to carry along driving and the battery will charge itself back up to 70% and then stay at around about 70% but at the moment pure electric drivetrain the little rotary engine isn't isn't spinning at all uh, and uh, yeah we're, we're off on a off on a bit of a road trip um, let's head off to Broadway. So we're on our way to the Cotswolds, um, to Farncombe Estate, where we're going to be recording an episode of the Drive Talk podcast. Two episodes, actually. We've got Becky Evans on there first today. That's tomorrow's episode, so Pat's going to have to do some really quick editing. <laughs> and then, uh, then we're recording a second one this afternoon. So a busy, busy day. 
we're a few miles into the journey um, and I'm still all electric. The engine hasn't kicked in at all yet. I'm averaging 2.7 miles per kilowatt hour, which is, is pretty efficient. One thing I would say though, oh, it sorted itself out now. The speed sign recognition uh, was showing 60 and I was actually in a 30, it's a bit naughty. Um, now, this car is not a performance car. Some of you might get in this car and think it's a bit slow and a bit lacklustre, but I guess I'm trying to think, not everyone is as performance obsessed as me. An electric car doesn't need to do 0 to 60 in three seconds. This is a normal family car for normal people to do normal journeys. And its performance is adequate for you to do that. It's just not, it's not zippy and it's not buzzy like some electric cars. That said though, once you are in an open bit of road and you can start to put the car into some corners, it has very good road manners. It has a lovely feel to the steering. We're in a National 60 now, so that's me flat to the floor and I'm from 40 up to that 60. So it, it, it's, it's progressive acceleration, not set your hair on fire. But once you are going, it's really, really smooth. Now, interestingly, the little rotary engine has now kicked in. And listen, I can't hear it. It's so quiet. There's a tiny hum in the background and it won't be picked up on the mics on my cameras at all. It's like a in the background. It's so quiet. So it's now charging. I'm now down to 62% of the battery. And I'm still in normal mode. I haven't put it into charge mode yet. The other thing to note is like a lot of EVs on the back of the steering wheel, I've got two paddles to adjust my regenerative braking. So I've got my regenerative braking set onto the maximum. It, I wouldn't quite say it's one pedal driving, but when you lift off the throttle, you can feel the car slowing itself down. And again, that isn't a feature that you find in that many plug-in hybrids but because this is an electric drivetrain that kind of makes sense and it, it fits in with the character of the car so I'm finding this fascinating I jump in and out of so many different types of cars petrol and diesel and self-charging hybrids and plug-in hybrids and full battery electric and this this is like a kind of aggregation of all of those things it's got characteristics of all of those cars. Now the petrol engine's kicked in a little bit, I've just noticed that my MPG is showing us 288.9 miles to the gallon. <laughs> but that's because it kicked in for a very short period of time. I think for those numbers to make sense, you need to be patient and you need to put some miles on the clock. Because, but it, it's fascinating as well that this car's indicating both mpg and miles per kilowatt hour again the first car i'm pretty sure i've been in that does that flat chat that's it foot flat to the floor okay so um coming into this car i've now i've now depleted the battery down to 55 percent and i'm gonna go into charge mode so i'm now in charge mode and it will charge the battery over time up to 70 percent so our little rotary engine is now spinning, as well as the drivetrain being driven by the electric. So I should go from 54% up to 70% whilst I'm driving along. Now what that's also going to do though, is because I'm now using fuel, my MPG number should change. It should become slightly more realistic. <laughs> but I'm now at 2.7 miles per kilowatt hour for the electric drivetrain, which, you know, in a lot of EVs, that's a really good efficiency number. And the fact that this is a, a plug-in hybrid, that's really, really good. 2.8 now, wow. I'm now using the petrol motor, but in some hybrids, you feel that transition between um, internal combustion engine drive and electric drivetrain. And, and in this, you don't feel that because there isn't one, because it's always being driven by the electric motor. All you hear, the only perceptible thing is when the rotary engine kicks in, you, you can hear it if your hearing's good enough. I mean, if you've got the radio on, you're never gonna hear it. There's no, 
vibration, there's no noise, it's a remarkably quiet thing. And now, this is just, this is the ultimate gateway drug into electric running. Most of the time this car is running as an electric car. But when the battery runs flat, instead of having to go off and find a public charger and have all the potential headaches that that can bring, you just put it in charge mode and let the car charge itself up. And then when you've got enough battery, you put it back in normal mode and drive along as an electric car again. And as if by magic, within, I don't know, 20 minutes, maybe not even that, I'm back up to 70% charge. So I can now go back into normal mode uh, and run on more, more EV. So it's quite interesting, it gives you something else to think about when you're on your journey. <laughs> just go between the different modes and just keep topping your battery up. And again, for me, that the argument is you probably wouldn't set that charge mode to anything more than 80% because you kind of want to operate within that 20 to 80% window because that's the quickest you're going to charge the battery up, right? So that's really, really interesting. So I'm now uh, on a dual carriageway um, and I am in, uh, in cruise, uh, adaptive cruise control um, and it's a really super easy place to be. Battery's now dropped down to about 40%, last time I spoke to you was at 70 so um, I am, I'm actually using engine and battery at the moment. Uh, MPG is running at 72 miles to the gallon, 3 miles per kilowatt hour so both really good efficiency numbers and when you're just sat here using adaptive cruise now the car only has a maximum speed of 87 miles an hour but like I said before that's still 17 miles an hour faster than you should be going anyway I wanted to just very briefly talk about the whole rotary engine thing because some of you might be sitting there going well hold on a minute but rotary engines are they, they, when Mazda ran them in RX-8, I think they'd be the first to admit I'd have next door neighbor with one. Terrible on oil consumption, not particularly good on fuel consumption. And they had some reliability issues. But a lot of those were to do with the way they were driven because rotary engines, when that's just the form of, of propulsion for the car, often have quite a high red line. Um, and that's a kind of flexible red line as well. So you, you'll find that the cars are driven quite hard. And that, that going up to the red line, driving hard, that's where you start to get the kind of reliability issues. The interesting thing about this rotary engine is I have no input into how it spins up or what RPM it runs or how it runs. It's on a duty cycle running as a generator and it can be doing that well within the reliability tolerances of the engine. So that it's a far more reliable unit, if you like, than it would be if I was having the car driven by a rotary engine. But it's small and it's compact and it's light. And I think it's really very cool. Nearly there, dude. Yeah, we are very nearly there, only about 10 minutes away. So I thought I'd do my final report on where we are from a kind of battery and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, still got uh, 44 percent of the battery even though I've been in the normal mode it's kind of just hovered between sort of 45 and 50 percent battery charge with the motor the engine kicking in every now and again um, so I've still got 20 miles of all electric range and 140 miles of petrol range and then average fuel consumption so petrol 39.6 mpg and electric I'm running at 3.8 miles per kilowatt hour which is mega really really impressive so I have to say um, I am hugely impressed with this car as a as an overall package it it's not a performance car it, it, it doesn't it doesn't give you that kind of that kind of buzz in terms of of acceleration and all that kind of stuff but it drives nicely it has a nice presence on the road it's got lovely steering and really nice balance through the corners and on a dual carriageway with the adaptive cruise it's a very very relaxing place to be but I just think as a proposition for someone who wants wants to go electric but isn't convinced about going all the way I'll say now I think this is the best plug-in hybrid I've driven full stop um, just in terms of 
um, the, the range that the all-electric drivetrain has, but the way that this little rotary engine kicks in, the way it tops up the battery. I've driven probably better plug-in hybrids on a short journey that give more performance and more EV punch. But when you take them on a longer journey, the battery tends to kind of run down and then you're running on a really tiny petrol engine and your fuel economy goes out the window. This, you don't get any of that. You get the same drivetrain performance, irrespective of how long you've been in the car. It's just that that little rotary engine keeps topping the battery up and you can just keep going for miles and miles. We've done 140 miles. I've still got 140 miles worth of, of petrol and 20 miles worth of electric. And when I get to my destination, I'm staying um, at the Fish this evening, my favorite hotel in the UK, and they've got electric car chargers so I could put the car on charge, top up the battery pack and get an extension of range, which just means I don't have to go to the petrol station too early. It's really, really good. <laughs> I guess the last thing we should have probably talked about this right at the beginning price point wise this is the top spec MX30 with the um, hybrid drivetrain and this is just under £40,000 a spec so you're under that £40,000 tax issue that we get here in the UK so yeah really interesting anyway I'm nearly at my destination I'm gonna love you and leave you put in the comments what you think below but if you've enjoyed that give me a thumbs up as I said, comments below are always welcome, and if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to Petrobed for plenty more content to come. And I'll see you on the next film. We're nearly there, dude. And you get to see Uncle Joe and Uncle Pat. Yeah, and stay at your favorite dog-friendly hotel. Yeah. Could oh, you all right, dude? <laughs> anyway, take care, guys. Drive safe.